Hello, my friends. This is The Art of Prepping. Hope you guys are doing well today. So I've gathered up five questions that I've recently received, and I'm going to answer them in this video. So I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it's just something that I like to do. I don't really do this very often, as you know. I, I really should do this more often, but uh, I just kind of found five questions that really was fun to think about, and I thought maybe it'd be kind of cool to just share this. And uh, So let's just jump into it. So I'm going to paraphrase the questions because some of the questions that are sent to me are very wordy, which is fine, uh, but um, just to kind of make it more... Uh, bearable <laughs> to make the video <laughs> more bearable. Um, I'm going to kind of just paraphrase the questions. So uh, the first uh, paraphrased question is, what are your top foods to store for man-made or natural disasters? I mean, good question. Um, of course, everybody has their food preferences, right? We all have different palates and, and all that. So uh, I'm going to give you like a short list of my favorites, but just knowing, you know, as a side note here, to make sure you have plenty of water stored as well with your food. I mean, it would be a nightmare to have 10 years of food, but only three months of water. That would be really bad. So the rule of thumb for water storage at the very minimum is one gallon per person, but it's much more ideal to have two to three gallons per person put back for the timeline that you want to have. So basically the reasoning is this, you know, you have hygiene needs and you have possibly the, the need to uh, cook uh, with water, you know, so it's not like sometimes that you're just going to just drink a gallon of water and that's what you're thinking, you know, that gallon's for, but really that gallon is supposed to be for several things. But if it's in the middle of summer and it's super hot and you and you need to be physically active, you could, in theory, drink a whole gallon of water. And that'll leave you nothing for hygiene or for cooking and some other things. So it's just more ideal to have two to three gallons. For me personally, I put back three gallons a day. Uh, so that's just what I do. But back to the, the main question here the top foods to store uh, for myself that I really enjoy. It's going to be sardines from Poland. I like Alaskan salmon. Um, I like the big chunky chicken, uh, canned chunky chicken. I like roast beef. Um, I don't do a lot of roast beef in my everyday life, but uh, I do put some back in my storage. Um, also turkey. I like turkey. Um, I'm not someone that eats a lot of ham, uh, but I do love bacon. Uh, but... Um, I don't really put a lot of, uh, you know, canned bacon back. I have a little bit and I, I do have a little bit of ham put back, but, but not much, but it is there. It's the reasoning I don't mind having some ham is because you can mix it with other things. For example, I, I like to put back um, various fruit toppings like cherry, strawberry, and, and, and a whole host of others. And, and I like to mix it with my ham. And even some of the other meats. I just really enjoy that. And also, just talking about fruit toppings. Um, basically, I love apples. So, I like canned apples. And I even get apples that are more like apple pie filling. And some people also can, you know, reference that as apple or fruit apple type of toppings or whatnot. But it, basically, I get it on the can. It actually says apple pie filling. So I really enjoy that, especially those that have a little bit of cinnamon in it, cinnamon and some other um, just natural sweeteners. So that's awesome. Um, I love beef stew, you know, really hearty, thick beef stew. Um uh, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, I know that not everyone is into stew, but I am. I'm not really into soup, which is kind of funny because it's like you would think that soup and beef stew or stew in general would be kind of similar. And they are, but not in, not to me. Um, beef stew or stew in general is a lot thicker and it's, it tends to have a lot more, um, I don't know, more substance to it. And then you have soup, which is a lot more runny. And I'm not a real big fan of runny stuff. Um, I mean, I can tolerate soups, but I'm not a real big soup fan. Okay. And also, 
I have some uh, baked beans, but these baked beans don't use tomatoes because tomatoes bother my stomach. So I have uh, tomato-free baked beans, and, and I, I get the baked beans that have, you know, pieces of like maple, Canadian maple bacon uh, chunks in there. Oh, it's so good, you know. It, it, and most of the baked beans that I have are like using like, uh, I believe it's like white beans. And there might be a few others that use pinto beans, but I think most of them are white beans. They're like small white beans. Um, in fact, let me just go over there real quick. I'm just uh, in the house here, so I, I could actually reference that real quick here. Okay, yep, it is. It's um, just uh, the smaller white beans. So very cool. So I hope that helped that individual just get some ideas and maybe, maybe you know, possibly yourself, you know, just some things to think about. But I have to say, though, if you just kind of said, hey, what's, what's your favorite on the list? <laughs> it would be really hard to tell you, but I have a thing for sardines. I'm just going to be straight up with you. I love sardines and uh, I really like salmon too, but I think sardines is, is really, it's, it's a clear winner for me. Uh, the thing about sardines though, it can be kind of expensive to put a bunch back. So that's, that's a negative for a lot of us, but uh, I would say this. I would avoid getting sardines in some kind of uh, soy oil or a bunch of these other oils. Uh, now, olive oil, if you can get the extra virgin olive oil, that's awesome. That's very healthy with your sardines. And uh, But typically, though, just because of cost, I get my sardines just in water, you know. And so I get them like just basically smoked sardines in water or just the plain you know, just like, just plain sardines in water. So that's typically how I, how I do it. But of course, if you're into sardines, you know that you can get it in tomato sauce or mustard or hot sauce. I mean, it's just, <laughs> there's a whole world of sardines to explore. So there you go. The next question is, what is the most carried blade? Uh, Okay, uh, so basically on this one, I'm just going to say that I'll just kind of paraphrase this a little bit better. Um, so what knife do I carry the most? I think that's I think that's what the person means. Um, so I carry and this doesn't mean this is my favorite knife. It's just the, the knife that I tend to carry for whatever reason. I, I think it's just a combination of small form factor. It's very lightweight. It doesn't cost much. So if I lost it, I wouldn't be so upset. And it holds uh, an edge enough that I only have to really hone the blade uh, roughly every five to seven days. So basically once a week on average, I would say. And that is the K-Bar Dozer Hunter. And the one, I mean, I have a bunch of the colorations of them. I have several of these, but the tan coloration, I guess it's just because it's a little more visible, uh, you know, like to the eye. Like it's just, it's just, uh, it kind of stands out a little more. So it's easier to kind of like, if I set it down somewhere, it's easier to see it so I don't just lose it. Uh, so I guess that's the reason I like that coloration, but yeah, of all the blades out there and all the blades that I have, <laughs> it's, it is kind of comical that I, I come back to like a $20 blade, but the K-Bar Dozer Hunter, and, uh, they do now make it in D2 steel. So if you don't like the Oz 8, uh, the D2 steel is, um, it could be another option. I'm just not a real big fan of the blue handle and, and I don't know, it's just kind of me. I'm not a... I don't know. There's certain colors, you know, I mean, I love blue, you know, like it's one of my favorite colors and I like green too, but just not on my blades. I don't know. It's just, it just doesn't work so much. Maybe because I don't live in an urban area and I'm not very urban minded. Um, I'm more woodsman minded and, and, you know, it's kind of, I like my stuff to be a little bit more subdued in color, but that's just kind of my preference. So, um, but there's, there's obviously a, a, I could give you a whole list of spider code knives that, you know, I rotate out with every once in a while, but I think about a good solid 80 to 85% of the time I grab the K-Bar Dozer Hunter <laughs> and it, and it just, uh, satisfies all my needs. It's just crazy. I mean, it cuts zip ties, no problem. It breaks down boxes, no problem. Opens up mail of all different types. I mean, it just cuts cordage. I mean, it's great. Okay, the third question here, what is the most practical firearm in your opinion? Okay, um, 
Yeah, this is this is pretty a difficult question, really. Uh, the so basically, like, what is the best overall overall firearm, in my opinion? Because um, when I think of practical, I'm thinking about something that's going to be really usable on a regular basis from multiple situations. So I, I would say that that's probably the overall best firearm. So I'm going to have to narrow it down to a handgun just because of the practical element of it. And I'm going to say a nine millimeter so that I have at least some stopping power, some, I think a 380 would probably be possibly adequate for a lot of situations, but I would like to have a decent nine millimeter though round just to ensure that I have enough power to, to do what I need to do to stop a threat, for example. Um, now I will say though, deep down, I have a real attraction to 10 millimeter. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I really like 10 millimeter. I don't own 10, 10 millimeter, but I mean, if, if money was not, you know, an issue, I would, I would lean toward a 10 millimeter for the collection, but just for practical terms, just in terms of cost and just, you know, cause most people don't really need a 10 millimeter to get the job done. I think a nine millimeter especially the new modern day uh, variants of ammunition that's available, nine millimeter is pretty much good to go in, in most situations, you know. So if I was to narrow this down though to a, a nine millimeter handgun that was kind of like, kind of a general do-all, maybe not like perfect for every situation, but kind of like a, a jack of all trades to some degree, um, I would have to narrow it down to one of these four and then I'll tell you what I think I'd do with these four and how I would narrow it down even more. But the Glock 43X, the Palmetto State Armory, the 9mm Dagger, that's what it's called, Dagger. Now they, they have come out with different spellings of Dagger, I don't know. And of course there's apparently possibly like some kind of trademark infringement and they might have to change it to another term. But anyways, PSA's newer nine millimeter, you know, handgun. And uh, it, it does look pretty cool though. And I, I do plan on getting one eventually. But right now there's some uh, some problems. Um, I don't know if it's with all their firearms that are coming out, like all their, their you know, PSA daggers. But there's a, there's a couple little quirks, you know. Um, so anyways, uh, so they're, they're trying to figure that out. So I, I always give you know, a manufacturer a year or two <laughs> when they come out with something to kind of figure out all their problems and fix it before I get involved because I don't want to deal with some kind of issue. Um, another option is the Taurus. This is the newer Taurus GX4. At first I was like, eh, I don't think so. But then it's kind of grown on me a lot. <laughs> and it's actually on my list to get one eventually. Um, it may be a long time until I get one. Who knows? But I guess it's just when it's available in my area. They're just not available. They're always sold out, it seems like. So the Taurus GX4 is pretty cool. And then um, I have no experience with this, but I've watched a ton of reviews and everybody just loves this. And it's the Stoger STR 9C. It's the compact version. Um, pretty cool. Looks really nice. So, so with those four options... The Glock, the Palmetto State Armory, the Taurus, and the Stoger offerings. Which one would I pick? Um, I really couldn't figure it out, so I came down with two. Uh, the Glock 43X and the Taurus GX4. And that Taurus was a little bit of a surprise, but when I got down to it, it was in the, in the finals there. So I guess it would be between those two, depends on how much concealability I would need. If I needed the maximum concealability, I would go with the Taurus. And if I could, you know, open carry or, you know, basically carry with a outside the waistband holster, uh, you know, just carry on the belt, then the Glock 43X would be awesome with just like a shirt, you know, over top of it. And just so that uh, you, you can still easily conceal it, but it has a full size grip on that 43X. So there is a, a potential for it to print a little bit more, of course, than the, the Taurus GX4. <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, just as a side note, though, as a, a second most practical firearm, even though this wasn't asked, you know, in the question, I would go with the long arm. 
uh, just for more lethality in the range. And so it would probably have to be, you know, an AR-15. And I, I like to build AR-15s. Um, so, like, I haven't built very many of them, but, you know, I, I just, I like doing it. So I would make my own. I'd build my own. Uh, but um, there's plenty of manufacturers that, that you know, have them, you know, pre-built, pre-made. And then, of course, if you're into shotguns, um, that would be another good option. So for me, I'm not into shotguns, but if I was, I'd probably pick a more tactical variant uh, of a 20 gauge shotgun. Uh, I like 20 gauge when I have shot them. I, I don't have a very extensive history of shooting shotguns, but I, I have shot them. And 410 is just not enough power. Um, 12 gauge to me is very unpleasant um, to shoot. So I found that 20 gauge really isn't that bad. I like it quite a bit. And so still has a little bit of a kick, uh, but it's manageable. It's not not anything crazy. And I, I have been very successful in being very accurate with 20 gauge, uh, much more than even 12 gauge. But I wasn't bad with 12 gauge. I just really hated the experience because of the kick. Of course, you can get low recoil ammunition, but the 20 gauge, I think, is a more well-rounded you know, size, you know, uh, caliber and format. So that's just my preference. I know a lot of people just love the 12 gauge and, and, and if that's your thing, go with that. Okay, so um, number four, question number four is, what is your favorite non-lethal self-defense option? Okay. This is another thing that's kind of hard to narrow it down. So I came up with a collapsible baton and a tactical flashlight and pepper gel. Now, if you really said, hey, you have to just pick one, man, um, I think for the most part, it would be a collapsible baton. But most of my life, though, it's been the pepper gel. It's only been really a recent days that I've been doing the collapsible baton. That's just because I feel a little more confident that I'd have a little bit more, I guess, more effectiveness or at least the potential for more effectiveness, you know, because I've been practicing using a baton and I've been lifting weights, you know, a lot more and doing more physical conditioning. So I feel like a lot more able to really use and deploy a collapsible baton than before. And so that's just kind of my reasoning with that. But certainly pepper gel is really decent. You just have to know techniques and, and, and really understand how to use it and deploy it fast. And just make sure you know how you know to use it so it's not going to be used against you or that you you deploy it and you accidentally expose yourself. That's always been my concern is that I get some kind of blowback or, you know, something happens. That's why I stick with the pepper gel and not the pepper spray. So that minimizes almost all of the blowback and potential problems. But still, though, if you're wrestling with someone, you could always spray yourself by accident or something like that. So it's it's kind of a concern. Uh, but I still think it's a very good option. Okay, question number five, and the last question is, what, in your opinion, are the top 10 survival kit essentials? That's a really good question. It's actually really hard to narrow it down to just 10 items. So I'm going to give you 10 items, but I'm going to give you a bunch of others too, just because I don't want to leave it at 10. I don't want to kind of just suggest that, oh, it, you're fine with the you know just these 10. Um, but the question was very specific. So you just want to, you know, the top 10, but, um, as a bonus element, I'll give you a few more just to kind of round it off. So that can give you at least what I would consider the more bare bones, basic outline of a survival kit. So number one, I would say that you would certainly need a water filter. I mean, that's really important to have hydration and to have clean water to clean a wound. There's so much you can do with water. It's really, really important. Um, now, you can make an argument, though, that shelter is a little more important overall in the big picture of things than water, but you really can't go very, you know, long without water, just like, you know, in certain environmental conditions, you can't go very long without shelter. So they're both super important. It just depends on your situation. But, um, but just to start out the list, once again, these are not going to be in order from most important to least important. It's just, I just kind of mixed them all together. But number one is water filter with a container. And I would say it would be really awesome to have like a, a really durable plastic container 
just so it's lightweight to carry your water. And then a second container that's made of like metal, um, like stainless steel or titanium would be kind of the preferred. Uh, there are some potential uh, downside risk, you know, like with aluminum products, you know, over time, it isn't really safe to do a lot of consuming of product through aluminum. So stainless steel or titanium container, you know, in combination with maybe a lightweight option to carry water would be really awesome. The reason for the metal is that if you need to boil water, you could do that. Or if you want to cook food in your container, you can do that. Now the metal container, I would say, get a wide mouth container, you know, uh, that would definitely be better than just a, a regular, you know, narrow mouth container or just whatever is standard, but get the largest, you know, mouth container you can find, you know, so that's just something that I would do. Uh, another thing that I think is super essential is a light source and everybody has their preference. For me, it's more of a headlamp. Um, I do like handheld lights though. And I, I've been getting into lanterns more. So those are cool to have uh, a flare and it could be even an electronic flare. So it doesn't have to be a chemical flare, but a chem light, you know, like one of those snap lights or glow sticks, sometimes they call them, but uh, those can be really cool. Just know that there's different grades of quality of those. There's like commercial grade uh, chem lights, and then there's more of like recreational glow sticks. So there are some differences. Um, number three, or the third item in the top 10 is going to be cutting tools. I think maybe when the biggest bang for the buck is like a really decent full-size multi-tool because it has a bunch of other stuff than just a blade, right? And it's even better if you can get one that has a really good saw, like a wood saw. With that being said, though, it's really nice to have a larger companion knife, like a woods knife, with at least like a four-inch blade. Five inches is possibly even better. It just depends on your, you know, your uses, but... A folding saw might be essential also for your area. Just to, to put that in there as a bonus item. Folding saws, I know where in my area, there's there's woods everywhere. I'm surrounded by trees, woods everywhere. So if I was to, you know, have to bug out into the woods, I would really, really need and want. Uh, it's both of those elements there. It's a want and a need for some type of saw. And I think one of the more practical saws would be instead of trying to haul this big saw around like a stationary saw is to have a folding saw and of course they make all different size folding saws so i mean you have tons of options but it's also nice to even have a, like a pocket knife you know in addition to all this so, i mean there's so many things you could add <laughs> just within cutting tools and in some people where they live it, they want a little hatchet or they want an axe even i mean it really depends on what you can deal with and what you can handle and where you are. Number four, a tarp. I think a tarp, and this is, this is more of the shelter category. I think a tarp is like kind of the first line. This is kind of like very essential. Everyone needs a tarp, even if it's not a very big tarp. I mean, they have five by seven foot tarps. I mean, they're really compact and, they almost cost nothing. I mean, there's no reason why not to have those. Especially if it's a seal nylon tarp. Man, those are super lightweight. So those are super cool. Um, as a side note, though, it's really awesome to have a decent poncho. Now, some people say, well, go with a poncho tarp. And you kind of get a two for one. That is really awesome. And of course, with these products, you can do a lot of other things and just shelter with it. You can collect water. You can use it to uh, hold firewood if you're trying to transport firewood over distances to camp. You can do so much with this stuff. Just be careful that you don't, you know, puncture it, you know. So you, you want to get something that's robust. Um, but some people, they limit their uses of the ponchos and tarps because they don't want to damage it. But if you do damage it, uh, it's good to have some type of repair. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. We're going, there's actually a repair uh, category, you know, in this list, but just understand ways to repair your gear. So besides a, a tarp and poncho, though, you might also, as a side note, think about a bivy sack, 
of course, sleeping bags are really cool, but I don't know if I would put that as essential gear. Uh, but it is nice to have. Uh, mylar blankets are also really good to have. Some people would say that that is essential. Okay, uh, number five. The fifth item is going to be cordage. And there's a lot of good cordage options out there. In the last, I would say maybe five, six years, there's been some really interesting specialty cordage that's come to market. The downside is, is that it's not widely available unless you go online. Like it's not typically found in big box stores or even specialty, you know, sporting goods stores, at least a lot of this. And the cost is really expensive for what you're getting. Uh, I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that, I'm just saying you pay a lot per foot compared to the traditional offerings, which were just fine. So instead of maybe getting some kind of cordage that has a lot of added features like fishing line or Kevlar line or some kind of jute twine built in and all this special fancy cordage, which is super cool. And don't get me wrong, you know, I might even have a little bit of it. (laughs) So I'm not against it. But I'm just saying for the average person, you may not even ever use any of that. And it might be just completely overkill. And it just it could be kind of expensive because you'd probably want to have at least 50 feet. Right. I think an essential uh, an essential hank of cordage would be a minimum of 50 feet. In my opinion, I think a more ideal length is about 100. Uh, but you could certainly probably make do for a quite a bit of time with 50 feet. It just depends on if you're with a large group of people. It depends on the size of your shelter and, and all the uses that you may have. But I've I've broken this down to the very obvious two main choices out there for cordage, and that's the 550 Type 3 parachute cord, also known as paracord. And just make sure you get the USA made, you know, 100% nylon variant. And the bank line. Now, the bank line... You know, there's different kinds out there. It's tarred line. Some of the tar is different than other manufacturers. You might have to experience uh, different brands to find the one you like. But now bank line number 36 is kind of like the lightest that I would go. So I think 36 on up or or something thicker and more robust is going to be good for most people. But that's just kind of my, my opinion. 36 is kind of the minimum. Now, Item or category number six here for survival kit essentials would be fire starter. Fire starters are really important. You need to have fire. You know, I mean, this could really save your life. This is certainly an essential item. So many people forget about this, though. You would think that you would not forget (laughs) fire, (laughs) but people do. And it's something as simple as a ferro rod or a little box of matches I think it's awesome to spend a few more dollars, though, and get some storm matches or hurricane matches. Or just Sometimes they're just called waterproof matches. Or you can waterproof the matches yourself. But I think the most simplest way to make fire is not through a Fresno lens, <laughs> even though it's an option, uh, is through a lighter. Just get yourself some good lighters and have a little redundancy. Don't just carry one lighter. Carry maybe three lighters and a ferrule rod and some matches, and you're you're going to be good for a while, right? Okay, number seven, a map and a compass. And there's nothing wrong with having a GPS, you know, device with you. But don't have the GPS to replace the map and compass. And actually understand where you are before you go somewhere. And understand where you are on the map and keep up with it. Like, and understand how to use the map and compass. If you don't really know how to do it, then don't pretend that you do. Just research it. It's not like brain science. Okay. Number eight, first aid and trauma supplies. You know, having first aid kit, like a really nice comprehensive, I'm not talking about like some massive triage kit that, you know, it's the size of a backpack. I'm talking about just have your basic essentials. So you have some trauma gear to deal with, you know, severe bleeding. And that includes at least a tourniquet and a few other things like a pressure bandage and things like that. And then your first eight items are just to kind of deal with things like diarrhea or pain, uh, small wounds, you know, just it's obvious, you know, like a, a bug bites, you know, stings, things like that. Okay. Number nine, personal protection. 
Now, this could be, you know, inclusive to like some kind of uh, mask filtration, you know. So like if you're in a really horrible environment in terms of like uh, air quality, maybe a N95 mask or better is going to be smart to have. But the protection that I'm talking about more is like personal protection against threats like animals or other humans that want to hurt you or kill you. So I think that this is really, of course, dependent on what your your level of knowledge and training is and what your comfort level is. For me, it's a firearm. And going back to the most practical firearm on this list, you know, question number three, I think it would be a handgun again. I'd probably pick like the Glock 43X, you know, in a bug out uh, or something similar to that. Okay. So, of course, you know, some people would use blades or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can defend yourself. But if it's an option, a firearm is it's pretty good. Okay. Number 10 here, the, the 10th item for the survival kit essentials would be repair repair. Okay. And that's going to be like duct tape, zip ties, super glue, you know, repair patches, sewing kits, things like that. But if I just had to just pick one, it would be duct tape. And for me, it's Gorilla Tape, the Gorilla brand. I love Gorilla Tape. Now I can't really just stop there, even though those, those are the 10, but there, I need to add a few more just to kind of round this off to give you really a uh, more basic overview of the essentials of a survival kit because I would I feel bad if I just leave it at this and give the impression that that's what a survival kit should be even a basic one I think that you would definitely want to include some kind of two-way radio with the weather band and um, I mean for some people that may be by themselves or that they have no no use for a two-way radio then maybe at the very minimum some type of an emergency weather band radio. And you can get them though with AM and FM also on there. So that's awesome. You can even find them with shortwave on there. So, you know, there's some different options out there, but at least some kind of weather radio. And I think it's smart though, really to have the two-way option so you can communicate out. It can't hurt. Okay. And I like my um, two-way radios, not only to have the weather band, but to have the weather alert feature so that it can alert me that there's a problem. So that's really nice because you might be so busy with dealing with whatever that you may not be aware that there is some type of problem. And so if you have an alert feature, it can give you the heads up so that you can direct your attention to the incoming traffic. And so it kind of makes the traffic more of a priority. Okay. Let's not forget food. I, mean, I don't want to go through this list and just act like, oh, food's not a real issue. You know, in the very short term, food is like really low on the list to worry about in a survival situation. But after a day or two, you're going to need to eat, man. You got to keep your energy levels up. You know, you're not, you're not going to be thinking very clearly if your blood sugar is really low or if you're not used to fasting. Um, that's one of the reasons why I fast all the time. Uh, today, I mean, it wasn't even a very long fast. I did 18 hours and it was like not an issue at all. Like, I mean, I went out for a long walk and did all kinds of things and didn't even feel any kind of physical repercussions of fasting 18 hours. And so I personally do even 24 hour fast. Um, I'm working on doing more 36 hour fast. I think it's very good for you for one, but it also gives you an edge so it doesn't really bother your, you know, your, your, you know, your capabilities. It doesn't really interfere with you doing things if you're used to fasting. So I think, you know, it's just something to, to look into. But, you know, still, it's good to have some food as part of a basic survival kit. And even if it's just a little bit, you know, some kind of uh, energy bars and things, even though I'm not a fan of those kind of foods typically, you know, but something's better than nothing, I guess, if you're in a, a tense situation that, you know, you're burning through calories at a higher rate than normal. Um, also, signal gear. And this could be something as simple as a whistle, a signal mirror, 
uh, flares, like those flare pins. It could be some real simple stuff like that. Maybe it's just like a bright bandana or a signal panel or something. I mean, there's all kinds of real simple things. I mean, you can make, you know, basically uh, various symbols, you know, in in you know in the ground and contrast it with you know the surroundings so that it kind of stands out you can make signal fires there's all kinds of things you can do but uh if i was just to pick one of all those um i think the flare pen is pretty cool honestly but uh either that or maybe like uh the signal mirror because the signal mirror can really reach out a lot further than a whistle can be heard. So, I mean, there's pros and cons with all this. Okay. So we also have hygiene. We don't really want to skip that, even though there's a ton of people that, that build kits and they don't ever think about hygiene. And some of these kits are meant for you to like, you know, survive for weeks at a time. And there's no hygiene. You need to have something to clean up with. And I think really, in my opinion, the simplest solution is unscented regular wet, wet wipes. You can just get generic big box store branded wet wipes and you can get a whole case of them for cheap, cheap. So that's an option. I mean, there are some people who like the alcohol based hand sanitizer. That's, that's possibly a way to go. And they, they want to have a rag or two, like a washcloth that makes some sense. Maybe a bar of soap, maybe if you have water available, but the wet wipe is probably the simplest if you ask me. And then, um, let's just kind of wrap this up. Um, it's also very nice. You could argue this is not essential, but man, I tell you what, it might be if you need power and that is a solar charger. And we're talking about those really portable, small and portable devices that have a few little panels that roll out. It's maybe like the size of like a notebook or something, right? And it folds out. And typically what you see with those, they're either like 21 watts or 28 watts. And, um, and they give you a nice charge. Typically now that they're able to charge two devices at the same time. So you could charge your phone, you could charge a radio, you could charge a light source, all kinds of things. Okay. And actually, I do have one more thing here. And that is clothing. It's really nice if you even if you have a very basic bare bones survival kit to have a change of clothes. And if possible, put a hat with it. If it's in the summertime, maybe a sun hat. If it's in the wintertime, put a toboggan or a scarf with it. And don't forget some gloves, right? Some work gloves. And then, of course, maybe some gloves, depending on the temperature of the of the year. Maybe if it's summertime, you don't even need gloves besides work gloves. But if it's the wintertime, you could have your work gloves and maybe some kind of insulated gloves to keep you warm. And you can't go wrong with a few extra pairs of socks, right? And for some people, it's super important to have some good footwear, some good pair of boots. That's what I would say. And to keep that with your your survival kit. So these are just some ideas. We could go on and on about this, of course, but I wanted to kind of just give you a few extra there just to kind of fill in some of the voids because <laughs> I don't want to just leave it at 10 items when in reality, a survival kit is much more than that. Okay, so just remember that survival is is a lot more about mindset and skills and the wisdom of how to go about things more so even than the stuff that we have sometimes. So it's good to have the stuff, but then, you know, the actual kit, but you have to know how to use it. You have to have the the knowledge of how to go about uh, keeping yourself calm and focused. And um, and from there, if you know what you're doing, you'll, you should be fine, you know, or you'll, you'll have less suffering overall. So keep preparing and thank you for your questions. I hope this was enjoyable on some level and interesting. And um, I, I had a blast, actually. I, I, I like, you know, being able to answer questions like this. It's, it's a lot more natural than trying to type it out and send it to you. I almost feel like I'm not really doing it justice when I send you a couple sentences or a little paragraph trying to answer a question. It, it's just a lot nicer for me and just overall it feels better 
to do these kind of videos. So maybe these kind of videos would be, you know, I'll do this more in the future. I don't know. It just depends on how you guys like this. But you guys take care. We'll catch you later.